Amen. We just want to welcome you this morning to our Sunday morning celebration service. Right there we're at. Give God some praise this morning. We just want to welcome you. We thank you for joining us online. We're just going to go ahead and open up our service this morning with a word of prayer. Father God, we just come before you, my God, and we thank you for this time, my God. We ask, my God, that you would just meet us here, God, that you would continue to be in our midst, my God. Lord, we ask, my God, that you would anoint the messenger tonight, my God. We thank you and we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and we all say amen and amen. Right there we have, give Jesus, make, uh, make some happy for Jesus.
this morning all over this place. Oh, Father, we just come to worship you, Lord. We come to praise your mighty name, oh God. Oh, you are worthy, you are 
honored to be here today in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We want to continue in the attitude of worship. Amen. We want to, if you have a need this evening, we want to lift up your need this evening. You might say, man, I just need a, I need a touch today. I need something to happen in my life today. There's a lot of things that we can be praying for. There's things that we need in our lives. And, and how many know that God is able to meet any need that we have? And maybe, you know, we're praying for my daughter and my grandson and, you know, that for her, for, for peace, you know, for comfort, for him, for that God will take him to the process of growth because how many know he needs to grow? That's what he needs to, he needs strength, he needs things to come in, you know, in a place so that, you know, there's no like, you know, he's there, he's in one piece, but we need him to, to, you know, to begin to breathe on his own, to begin to, all these things that need to happen over the next few months, and right now we want to pray, there's like, he has some bleeding in his head, so, you know, they want to, they, it's not gotten bad, but, you know, it's been like the way for a couple of days, and they, they're just giving him antibiotics to help fight the infection, and we believe and we trust God that he has his hand upon his life and that whatever his will is, right, God is going to bring it to pass. We want to pray that, that right now that God would be with him, intercede for him. And we believe, we're as, we believe as Christians that God's hands upon his life right now. Amen. So we were trusting God. We're believing. We, we know, we know God, you know, and we want to pray for, for her for peace because, you know, We've not, I've never been to that, and I know that she's going through something in her life that she's never been through before. So it's also a time where she needs comfort, you know, for the Holy Spirit to come, comfort her, and, and really show her, God to show her that He has everything under control. Amen? Amen. So we're going to pray, we're going to believe, and then we're also, whatever your need is tonight, you might know somebody that, that needs a touch from the Lord today, and we're going to ask God to, to meet that need today. Amen? Praise the Lord. So we're going to go ahead. If you have a need, we're going to go ahead and lift our hands and then go ahead and take our knees before the Lord. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to the seat and we pray, God. We pray for Adriana. We pray for Miles. We ask that you be with them. This and we pray, God, that you keep your hand upon them right now, God. Father, we pray for healing, God, upon his body, God. We pray that you, God, would breathe life, the same life that you've given him already, God, but to strengthen his lungs, to, to God, to dry up the bleeding within his, his head, God. I pray, God, that your hand would be upon his life right now. Lord, you, you know everything about him. You know every hair on his head. And Lord, I pray, God, right now, God, that, that a miracle will take place within his life. It's already a miracle that's in place, God. But I pray, God, that right now, everything would to fall into place, that you be with them, that you, that you would just give him strength in his body to grow. And I pray nothing would happen. Not, no difficulty would take place right now, God. Lord, I pray for Adriana that you be with her, comfort her, give her peace, give her comfort, give her strength, God. I pray that you would just be with them both tonight, God. Father, bring healing upon both their bodies. Father, we pray for miracles to take place, God, in every life, God, in everyone that's here, God. Whatever our need is tonight, God. Father, I pray that you would have your way, and I pray that you would move in a miraculous way today. Father, we love you, God. We thank you, God. We give you all the glory, and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone says, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Look to that person next and say, it's good to see you here today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So at this time, we already pray for our needs. Go ahead and have your seats. Amen. We're going to, um, just a couple of announcements. We're getting ready for our, our evangelism month. We're going to be hitting the streets in July. So on... July the 8th, we're going to have, July the 7th, excuse me, we're, we're going to meet here, it's going to be our first night, we're going to kick it off, we're going to have an in-house evangelism, so we want to invite everybody to come here, we're going to be putting, we're going to be having board games, you know, we're going to put out, you know, a couple of screens, you know, some of the kids want to play video games, things like that, we're going to have a night of just fellowship, but we want you to invite people, 
So yeah, we want you to invite your cousins, right? Your friends, your, your relatives. Invite people to come out a night of just being here, coming together, a fellowship, and, and just, you know, spending time together. And then, you know, being able to, you know, be where we can fellowship people or, or get to meet them. So we want to do, we're going to be doing that on, on Friday night, July the 7th. We're going to be right here in the sanctuary. We're going to be, like I said, we'll have food, snacks, things like that. We'll all just bring, we can just all bring whatever, you know, whatever you have a snack or something you want to just bring something. We'll, just, we'll all be here and, you know, we'll have a blessed time. We'll have some, we'll have some fellowship and have a little bit of fun, play some board games, you know, if you, whatever game you like. If you like certain board games, bring them with you. Now, I know we have, we have like a board game that we play in our family. We get together and. Like, we play this game, and so I'm pretty sure we'll have it here because that's the game that we play. Amen? So, yeah, come out. You know, let's fellowship. Don't stay home. All right? Come out. Like I said, invite some people. Invite them to come out. Tell them, hey, we're going to have a, a game night, a family night in our church. Come out and join us. And then, you know, we'll come and, you know, just be here in fellowship on Sunday. And then on Saturday, actually Saturday, uh, we're going to be going out to the streets, going out and ministering. You know, like I said, it's a straight shot of, of evangelism. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be going out. Something's going to be happening every night in the month of July. So on July the 8th, we're going to be going out to the streets. And then on Sunday, we'll have our sneaker Sunday. We'll come to church. We'll be more like a little, you know, come in sneakers. Bring your sneakers. You say, well, you know, come a little dressed down. I mean, and you can come in your sneakers. And we're going to have a, have a service. And then we're going to take off from here. <laughs> we're going to, you know, pipe. Put the sound away real quick, and then we'll take off. And then we'll just kind of go out and minister to people. You know, kind of talk to people. At that time, we'll probably even have our, our tickets, because in a few weeks after that, we're going to be having our pancake breakfast. And so we'll probably have the tickets then, so we can probably hand out tickets to people we see out on the streets. Let them know, you know, we're having, we're having this event. You know, we want to welcome, we want to invite you, and let people know. It's a free event. We're just doing simple stuff, pancakes, probably some, maybe some scrambled eggs, some bacon. Some orange juice and coffee and praise the Lord and some fellowship. Amen. Like, you know, what I'll say is like, just some pancakes, some pancakes. Like basically a grand slam. Right? We're doing a grand slam. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, you know, we're gearing up to that and we're going to be having that. And like I said, we'll be hitting the streets. And I, I hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have all our flyers ready and then we'll be doing those as well. I'll be getting people to come during the month and probably help us out and really target some of the areas of. The, you know, the community where we want to pass out flyers. Amen? Praise yeah. the Lord. I'm glad you guys are all excited about that. I can see your faces. You guys are looking really, like, overexcited. Amen? Praise God. So with that, um, we're going to go ahead and pick up our tithes and offering this evening. Amen? Praise the Lord. So we have the box. Amen. Praise God. The Bible says what? It says that God loves a cheerful giver, right? It says to bring your... Hold tithe, right, and offering into the house, right? The Bible says to test the Lord and see if he will not open the flood gates of heaven and pour out a blessing. Now, I don't know about you, but the part where there won't be enough room to contain. You ever had something like where you're, where you're like, you're pouring something in and then it starts to overflow and you have to grab something right away and continue? Well, that's the same way it is with the Lord when you when you give, right? There's a blessing that comes with it. And God is able to provide a blessing that's so enormous, so big that we're that we're not able to contain it. And I'm not gonna say he's gonna all of a sudden across your mind is gonna go the winning lottery numbers for this evening. No, it's not gonna happen that way. Right? What I'm saying is that there's gonna be a blessing, right, that comes from the Lord. Amen. And we should be people that say, you know what, I, I want to receive God's blessing. I want to see, receive the good stuff that God has for me. Amen? Those of you tuning in online, we're going to provide a QR code in just a minute, and we're going to be providing a way where you can give on Tidely or PayPal. Amen? But this evening, challenge yourself, right? Challenge yourself to give in a way where you're open to receive. Amen? Praise the Lord. We're going to go ahead and pray for this, this offering. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come to you, God. Father, we lift up this offering to you today, God. We ask that you be with us today, God. Bless those that can give and bless those that can, Lord God. I pray, God, today, God, that you bless the giver and bless those that are not able to give, God, that may be able to give at a later time, God. We ask that you just move in a mighty way. We thank you for always being the God that provides, God. We love you, God. We thank you. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, 
Amen. Praise the Lord. We're ready to give you these coins. thank all of you for your giving this morning and we are going to get right into the word and I have the pleasure of being able to speak this morning and what I want to do right now is I want to go ahead and open up in a word of prayer if we could all bow our bow our heads and close our eyes this morning amen dear heavenly father we come before you God and we just want to thank you for this time this opportunity lord father I pray that you use me to speak your word your message father God into the hearts and lives of your people lord Father God, I pray that they would be touched by it, Lord, that it would impact their lives, Father God. Lord, that we would be challenged by your word, Lord, and that, Lord, whatever it is we're going through, whatever it is we're facing, God, Lord, you get the honor, you get the glory, Father God, because we know that you're making a way for our situations, Lord. Lord, we thank you, we give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. In your mighty name we pray, amen and amen. And this morning I want to talk to you about uh, a, a young king, uh, by the name of King Josiah. And it's, this came about because I was thinking about my son Josiah. And I, I was, I was talking about why he, you know, talking to him about why he was named Josiah. And funny enough, he, he wasn't actually named based off of the biblical figure and off of this king right here. But it was a name that my wife had always liked. And we, you know, she, she liked the name. And we wanted to go through with it. And it just so happened that the meaning of king uh, the meaning of Josiah means that the Lord will support or the Lord would heal or help. And I began to think about that and I wanted to get a better understanding of who King Josiah was. This this man that God supported, this man that God helped him in a time of very that was very difficult. You see, when you read the story about King Josiah, you read about a young ruler coming into the throne at the age of eight years old. And he's faced with difficulties and challenges and, and is having to rewrite, rewrite the laws of God at a very young age. And it reminded me, so when I grew up, you know, we used to, we used to do family game nights, right? And and there's certain games that you that you play as a as a child that you play along your fam with your family, and there's two games that come to mind, right? That depending on how you were raised and depending on how you played with your family, the rules changed. And the two games that I can think of are Monopoly, right? And when you ever play a game of Monopoly with someone. That is not a part of your family, but as you begin to play, you realize that they have different rules than you. And all of a sudden, they're wanting to put money into the pot because when they land on free parking, they get all that money. And I think if you look up the rules, that's not necessarily a rule in the game. But for some reason, we've gotten that mindset of, of this is how some of us play, and some of us might play by different rules. And even Monopoly had to come out and say, oh, you can play by your own house rules. The second game that I think of all the time when it comes to playing by your own rules is Uno. That for some reason, everybody has a different rule set for the game Uno. And the rules change. Some, if you put a plus two down, then someone else can put a plus two, and someone else can put a plus two, and then you have that crazy person putting a plus four, and then you got the person at the end having to collect, what, what is that, 10 cards? And then you can keep adding on. Some people say, no, you can only do it three times. No, you can only do it twice. There's certain times where you have to draw cards, right? Some people have the rule of, you only need to draw three and then your turn ends. You play with crazy people, and they're like, no, you have to draw until you can play. And then you're stuck with half the deck in your hand, right? And so sometimes we, we come into a game, and, 
and we're having to play by someone else's rules. And then, and then there's times where we're like, well, let me look at the rule book. All right, let me let me actually look up what the rules say. Uh, if you've played games at, at my house and it's family game night, you know that we are always, where's the rule book? What does it say in the rules? Right? We we play multiple games and some I don't know how, but for some reason the booklets and the rules have gotten longer, and it's my job to read them all. So I'm in charge of reading the rules, understanding the rules, and making sure that everyone's playing the game properly. My brother is my second. He verifies that the rule is correct so he he's there and if i say okay this is what the rule book says this is what we need to do he's there to verify that it's actually what it says and that's the moment of clarity right when you finally get to what the actual rules say and it shows you how you're supposed to play the game i begin to think about this in in, in josiah's reign a young, a young ruler coming into this kingdom, having to play by the rules already established by his family. You see, his father was king and his, great, his grandfather was king. His grandfather was King Manasseh, who wasn't a very good king. In fact, he began to change the rules of how the people were to serve how the people were to serve God, and in fact introduced new altars to new gods and began implementing new temples, new altars, and different rules on how to worship these other gods. And he began to take God out of the picture. And you see the, the, the name Man, uh, Manessa actually means forgotten. This was a king who had forgotten what it was like to serve the one and only God. He had forgotten. He was so fixated on introducing all these different cultures, all, all these different forms of worship, so much so that he got into a point of, of, of uh, child sacrifice to these gods. Something that wasn't established in the kingdom of God at that time. It wasn't established in Jerusalem. But this man began to establish new altars and even began to sacrifice young children to these gods. Josiah coming into, coming into authority at eight years old. It says this in 2 Kings chapter 22. Starting in verse 1, it says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. His mother was Jedida, the daughter of Adia from, Bo from Bozkath. And he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, and followed the example of his ancestor David, and he did not turn away from doing what is right. He didn't turn away from what he was doing right. There was so much opposition, so many things that were coming against him. The rules had been changed. And yet King Josiah comes into rule, and begins to identify things that aren't right. And it says that as he was in charge of reestablishing and doing your basic maintenance of the temple, as you will. He was going in and his, his advisors were in the temple and they discovered a scroll. And it was a, it was a, a scroll with the laws of God in it. And many... Many believe that this was the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy rediscovered. Now, if you ever read the book of Deuteronomy, it's a book of laws, but it also has the history of his people. It has the history of the Israelites, of the Hebrews, and it goes back all the way to Egypt and begins to talk about what God delivered them from, begins to talk about what God had rescued them from. 
And he began to read this, and it's, or his advisor begins, begins to read this to Josiah, and Josiah can't help himself but by be overwhelmed at the thought that he had not been serving the, his God properly. He found the rule book. He found the rule book, and when he began to read it, he realized that they were not serving God the right way. So what did he do? He began to tear down the altars. He began to destroy all these different altars that his family had established and put into place to serve these other gods. He said, not anymore. We're going to do this the right way. Because there is only one true God. So he began to break down the altars. He said, things are going to change. The second thing he did was that he began to rebuild the temple of the Lord. It says here, Josiah initiated extensive repairs and renovations to the temple of Jerusalem, which had fallen into despair. While conducting the repairs, this is when he found, finds the scroll leading to renewed emphasis on following God's commandments. So the first thing he began to do was he began to, excuse me, he began to destroy the temples. The second, uh, sorry, destroy the altars. The second thing he begins to do is he begins to rebuild the temple. The third thing is he reinstates the celebration of Passover. A celebration that hadn't been taking place under these kings' rules. The kings, like I mentioned, had forgotten about God. Yet Josiah said, no, we need to reestablish some celebration. We need to bring about so uh, we need to bring about a remembrance of what God had done and what God delivered us from. The fourth thing is he began to destroy pagan worship. Josiah ordered the destruction of the pagan high places, the shrines, and the places of worship dedicated to foreign gods, particularly those associated with Baal. And even destroy the altars and high places that were established by the kings of Israel. See, the, fourth, the fifth thing is he began to seek the guidance of the prophets. See, the prophets had begun to be established because the kings started failing. You see, Israel was to, at a place where they said, we want kings. We want people to rule us. And God gave it to them. And as the generations went by, these kings started failing. So then God had to raise up prophets. So that way, these prophets could instruct the kings. And many of the kings didn't listen to these prophets. But Josiah said, I'm going to listen. I'm going to take heed. If they came from God, if they have insight about what God wants, then I am going to listen to the prophets and follow their guidance. It says that it says that Josiah sought guidance from the prophets, including the priest, the priestess uh, Halda, who confirmed the authenticity of the discovered scroll and foretold the impending judgment upon Judah for past sins. And Josiah took her words to heart. And sought to lead the people in repentance. There was a turning point, And he said, from here on out, I not only am I going to serve God, but I'm going to lead the people that are under me to repentance. The sixth thing that he did. What is he? He renewed the covenant. Josiah gathered all the people of Judah, both small and great, and read the book of the covenant aloud to them. In a solemn ceremony, they renewed their commitment to follow God's commandments and keep 
their covenant. They rededicated their lives. Say from this point on, we are going to serve the one true God. But here's the thing. As righteous as King Josiah's, as King Josiah's, sorry, as righteous as King Josiah was, Jerusalem still fell victim to, to exile. They were still, they were still overtaken by the enemies. And you think, well, if he was so great and he began to do all these things and he was leading the people to reform, why did this take place? Why did God let this happen? You see, as righteous as King Josiah was, it was not enough for one man's righteousness to save the entire kingdom. It was not enough for one man's righteousness to save the sins of the entire kingdom. Yeah, well, that's not, that's not what I want to hear. Shouldn't there be a happier ending? There is. I'm going to get to that. But how does this relate to us? Right? How, how does what happened to King Josiah and the way that he ruled and the things that he established relate to us? And I begin to think about this. I begin to think about the altars. Just like the past kings had established altars to other gods, different things that they were erecting in their country and in their land and in their households, that we ourselves come to a point sometimes where we've established things that need to be torn down. We've established things in our homes that don't need to be there. And if anything, they're causing destruction. And for us, it is taking that stance and saying, and I saying to ourselves and identifying that things need to change. There needs to be some things that have been erected either by myself or by my father or by my family that need to be torn down. Drug addiction needs to be torn down. Alcoholism needs to be torn down. Negative mentalities need to be torn down. And sometimes we get into this frame of mind of, well, this is how I've been raised, and this is what I've always known, and this is how we've always operated. And King Josiah could have fell in that and said, well, my father did it. My grandfather did it. Many of the, of the other kings before me have done it. Well, then I'll just do it. Instead, he said, no, things need to change. You got to understand, this was a young ruler. Eight years old, what maturity, what wisdom he had to identify things that his family had established and said, that's not good. God doesn't want that. We don't need this anymore in our land. We're going to abolish child sacrifice. And let me tell you something. We may, that may seem extreme, but let me tell you something. Some of the altars that we've erected in our household... Our children are going to pay for that. You see, if you grew up with a family that struggled with alcoholism, let me tell you something. You're sacrificing your children with that. Because they're the ones having to face it. They're the ones having to go through it. All the chaos and destruction. If your fa family struggles with drug addiction, well then let me tell you something. Your children are taking the sacrifice for that because they're having to live in that chaos and that destruction and that chaotic world of not knowing whether they're going to come to a loving, a loving household or things are just going to be thrown around everywhere. We have to identify things in our households, things in our heart that need to be torn down. What altars are you serving? Depression? Negative mentality? The idea that, oh, well, this is how I am and I will not amount to anything and I can't get through it. And we face that, right? But let me tell you something. When you serve a God that says, that you can overcome, 
When you serve a God that says, I'll display my strength in your weakness. When you serve a God that says, I've given you the victory. I've taken you holy. I've done all these things for your life. I'm going to take you from glory to glory to glory. How can you sit there and go, well, my life will not amount to anything. How can you sit there and, 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 and just sit in that sorrow and that negativity when you serve a God that says, I'm going to take you above and beyond anything you can dream of. Anything you could imagine. The temple restoration. Josiah sought to reestablish the temple and make it better. He didn't just say, oh, well, this is what it looks like. And well, we'll just keep it as, as is and we'll just dust it off a little bit. No, he said we need to reestablish it. We're going to build it better. Why? Because this belongs to God. How does that relate to us? I think of the church. There's things in our church that need to be done, that need to be taken care of. You say, man, you know what? I serve a great God. I want to take care of the house of God. I want to take care of the man and woman of God. I want to be there and I want to be a part and help reestablish God's house. There's a lot that needs to be done. Think you'll hear our pastor say it. We need worshipers. We need people in children's ministries. We need to get these things established. Because if we ever expect to grow and have people come in, then we need to have these things established for them to enjoy. You want to come into the house of God and enjoy the worship. And you want it to be the best worship. And we should, we should strive for that. We should have the mentality of that. That we want to be the best in what we do. We want the best preachers. We want the best children's ministry. We want to throw the best events. Josiah said, I want the best temple. Because my God deserves the best. Doesn't he deserve the best? You have your best to offer. See, if you're sitting there... And you're saying, well, the worship needs to be better. What are you doing? Step up. Be a part of it. Well, you know what? I don't like the way they preach. I don't like hearing that guy all the time. Then step up. Right? So I don't like hearing myself either. Step up. Say, you know what? I got this. I'm going to take control of it. Let me run with this. Whatever you need. Whatever you want me to do. Josiah initiated the Passover celebration, a celebration of freedom, a celebration of God's grace and God's mercy upon our lives. Let me tell you something. We have service three times a week. And if you didn't know, we have service three times a week. We come here on Sunday. We come here on Wednesday. We come here on Thursday. That's three times out of the week that we are given the opportunity for public celebration of what God has done in our lives. Some of us, we need to be like King Josiah and begin to initiate a reestablishment of celebration in our lives. Do you celebrate the fact that you're not where you used to be? Do you celebrate that? Do you, man, I thank God. That I'm no longer thinking like this. I thank God that I'm no longer addicted. I thank God for saving me. We have to get back to a place of celebration. You see, I've learned a long time ago that my worship and my posture of worship to God Is, is an expression of how thankful I am. How thankful I am for what God has done in my life. For the things that he's delivered me from. So when I look out at people who have a hard time worshiping, I look at those individuals and say, man, you must have forgotten. You must have forgotten what God did in your life. You must have forgotten what God rescued you from, what, what God saved you from. You must have forgotten all the times that God delivered you from that dangerous situation you were in. 
See, we shouldn't have a reason not to worship when we're coming in the house of God. There should, we should be ecstatic. We should be jumping with joy. Instead, we get here and then we get all shy and conservative and we can barely clap our hands. And every time I see that, I'm reminded of a message that Pastor Al had spoken at game convention. And he says, I can tell the enemy has a hold on your life because you can't even clap your hands during worship. And I heard all dang, that the enemy has a hold on your life because you can't give thanks to God. See, we shouldn't be ashamed to clap our hands. We shouldn't be ashamed to lift them up in worship. We shouldn't be ashamed to cry in the house of God. Why? Because we're all thankful and grateful people who God has done amazing things with. <clears throat> Josiah sought prophetic guidance. He was willing to listen to his leadership, to the people who God put in front of him to help lead and guide him. <clears throat> That's why we have leaders in the church. That's why we have our pastor, our pastor's wife. That King Josiah saw that God had placed prophets to help guide him and help lead him in, in the way that he should conduct his life, in the way that he should lead his kingdom, in the, in, in the way that God wanted. And he listened. He didn't just hear them out and ignore them like the other kings did. <clears throat> but he listened. He took to heart what they were saying. He was ready and willing to hear the guidance that was being given to him. See, some of us, we got to listen to the guidance that is being given to us, the direction for our lives. Sometimes we have the mentality of, I, I, I'll figure it out. Oh, I already know, right? We have the I know a mentality. My son's at that age where he knows everything, right? 10, 10 years old. <clears throat> we tell him something and the comment is I know, Right? So he's at that age of, I know. We have to be able to go to our leadership, to listen to their guidance, to listen to what it is that they're saying to us and take it to heart, knowing that it's not just coming from them, but that God uses men and women to be able to speak life into an individual. That God uses men and women to give direction to an individual so they can prosper, so they can be healed, so they can not have to go through the struggle. And the sixth thing that King Josiah did. Thank you. was he renewed himself. He got to a place where he asked God for forgiveness. It says when the scroll was read and he began to hear the laws of God and he began to realize that the kingdom that he was ruling wasn't following these laws. He was in distress. It says that he tore his clothes, right? And I'm not sure if he tore him literally, right? We sometimes read that. We, Paul does it, right? But Paul tore his clothes off or Peter tore his clothes and you think there's a bunch of naked guys running around. Figure of speech, right? Of distress. That he heard this and began to repent. God, forgive me for not following your laws properly. God, forgive me because we've been thinking about it all the wrong way. He renewed himself before God. And not only him, he prayed for the people. And he gathered the people together. And they began to renew their covenant with God.
we got to get to that place where we say, God, examine me. God, look in my heart. Have there been areas in my life where I haven't been serving you properly? God, I come to church. I know the laws. I've read, you. I, I, I've read your word. But God, I struggle to live it. God, there's areas in my life where I've, I've fallen short. And it's okay to admit that. See, Josiah, he didn't just want it for himself, but he wanted it for everyone. He gathered the whole kingdom together. So we're going to renew ourselves before the Lord today. See, our families, like I said, we need to, we need to examine our, our, what altars we've raised up within our family household, our family lifestyle. We've got to begin to knock some things down, gather the family together and say, you know what, from this day forward, we're going to serve the Lord. You know what, from this day forward, things are going to change. From this day forward, we put our hope in God. From this day forward, we love each other. From this day forward, we're going to be committed. Josiah got to that point. But like I had mentioned, that the righteousness of one man wasn't enough to save the entire kingdom. It's not enough sometimes that one person in the family is trying to correct the wrongs of everyone else. He couldn't do it. But let me tell you something. We serve a king that can. See, we serve a king that can cover a multitude of sins amongst a lot of people. And that's King Jesus. If there's anyone, any righteous king that can cover a multitude of sins, it is Jesus. We have to get to a place where we look at these things that King Josiah had established and begin to establish them in our lives. A young king with a lot of wisdom, and he was able to do it. Why? Because he loved his people. And he loved God. And he said, if anyone's going to change, it's going to be me. And it's going to be now. And he was, could you imagine, because of the decision he made, how many people's lives were saved? Could you imagine, because of the decision you make, how many lives can be saved in your family, in your household? The, the chaos that could be avoided, the destruction that could be avoided just by you saying, yes, God, today's the day. God, I renew my covenant with you today. Let's start new today. And let me tell you something, God's grace is so, so sufficient that you could do that every day. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, you sit on Saturday and ask for forgiveness Sunday. What I'm saying is that God's grace is efficient enough that despite our flaws and despite our setbacks, he's more than willing to give grace and mercy to those who seek it. And that is all I have for us this morning. But I'm going to close out in a word of prayer. And my prayer this, this morning is that we would take that time to reflect. Where are we at in, in our relationship with God? 
Has our relationship been established? And if it's been established, has that relationship, uh, uh, ha have we worked it out? Have we begin to invest in it? So if you can with me this morning, go ahead and bow your, eye, bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. And we're going to close this out in a word of prayer. And dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, God, and we just want to thank you for this time, this opportunity, Lord. And I pray right now, God, Lord, that you touch each and every one of us, Lord. Father God, give us the strength, Father God, to stand up, Lord, against anything, Father God, that may have already been established in our lives. Lord, help us to identify those things that have only caused destruction, distress, chaos, and help us to stand against it, Lord. Give us the strength to make the necessary changes, Father God, for ourselves, for our family, for our children, that there will no longer be suffering. God, give us the grace and mercy each and every day. And let us have the realization, Father God, that you are always with us. Father God, let us celebrate the victories. Let us celebrate the fact that we are no longer who we used to be, God. And Father, I pray this morning that those who, are, who, who wish to have a relationship with you, God, we would renew their covenant with you this morning, Lord. Father, that you bring forgiveness. You been st bring strength and encouragement to each and every one of us this morning, God. Put us on the right path, Lord. Give us the maturity, the knowledge, and the wisdom to walk an upright path, Lord. And give us the strength to stand up against anything that might come against you, God. Oh, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives this morning. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In your mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. We want to thank you this morning for joining us uh, for our Sunday morning service. And don't forget that we do have services on Sundays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, I don't believe we're going to be having service this Wednesday, but if you have the opportunity to come out on Thursday, 7 p.m. here at the church, come on out. Join in worship with us. Make an investment to celebrate what God has done in your life. And let me tell you something. When you begin to do that public declaration of worship, it's going to feel so good. So come out, celebrate with us, and we look forward to seeing you. God bless you.